We have been looking at a lesson on the plan of salvation and our need to preach that plan of salvation because God's plan includes the preaching aspect. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21, that after the wisdom or um, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And so there is the need for the preaching or the proclamation of that plan that God has established of salvation. That plan <clears throat> was set in order because God knew that man would commit sin. And that having sinned, he would thus need reconciliation to him. Thus God set forth a way in which to save sinful mankind which included Christ's death upon the cross and the establishment of the church. That was in the eternal purpose of God. And thus, there's God's grace in providing those things for man and his salvation. But there's man's part in that salvation process as well. Man must hear that word proclaimed, because Christianity is a taught and a learned religion. And being taught is necessary, thus hearing God's word, in order to produce faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 and verse 17. And thus, that faith, based upon a knowledge, causing us to make a proper conclusion that God is, that Jesus Christ is his son, that he died upon the cross for our sins, we can know those things. And based upon that knowledge, we thus have faith. But man also must repent of his sins. <clears throat> that is, there's a realization of sin itself, that he has committed sin. And then there must be within that individual a desire to live according to God's revealed will. Thus, there's the need for him to change. And repentance deals with honestly and fervently seeking the favor of God. It begins with godly sorrow that is produced by a realization of his guilt and condemnation, a knowledge of God's law, and, a, and an abiding faith and love for God and his will, and a sense of personal responsibility that I am the one who has done this. Then, based upon that godly sorrow, <clears throat> there is a turning from the sinful way of life. It is a turning to God in the way in which God has set forth, that is, His Word. And that, of course, being based upon the desire on the individual to do right and to be right. This leads then to a change in life. He changes his life and the way of life. And then there's the need to make restitution as far as possible. And restitution is very simply setting things back in the proper order. Then man must also confess his faith. We noted that confession has to deal with saying the same thing as God. God has said, this is my son. And we likewise say that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. A confession of our faith. And then man, as we noted last week, must be baptized. That baptism is a burial or an immersion. And while the English definitions or applications that the dictionary gives in our day might not give us a true meaning and does not give us a true meaning of the word baptism, the Greek lexicons always set forth that baptism is an, simply an immersion or a submersion. If the Greeks wanted to express sprinkling or pouring, they had words in which they could do that. Rantizo would mean sprinkling, whereas either balo or keo would mean pouring. But the, as you look at the scriptures, there's the need for much water, John 3 and verse 23. There's the need for going down into the water, and then while they are in the water, there's the baptizing that takes place. After the baptizing, there's a coming up out of the water. Those 
first and last actions, the going down into the water and the coming up out of the water, would not be necessary if it was not in a, a submerged a submerging that individual in that element of water. But it's also referred to as a burial. Buried with him in baptism, Colossians 2 and verse 12. The element, as we saw in Acts 8 chapter, is that of water. It's not as the Pentecostals would have us to believe today, Holy Spirit baptism, but the element is water as seen in Acts 8 chapter again. But now then, we also want to notice that baptism is for the penitent believer. In going through a review of our study and past lessons, we've noted that there is a teaching that needs to take place. That's why God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe because there's that teaching process. But there also has to be a learning process on the person who's hearing that word proclaimed. That leads them to have faith or belief. Then there's that aspect of repentance and confession of one's faith. All of those things come before the act of baptism. When we come to as done correctly concerning the facts of Christianity. There's evidence that is being set forth a small child, a baby, does not have the capability to process those facts that are set, being set forth to come to faith. That's what faith is all about, a processing of those facts that have been presented so that we come to a proper conclusion that God is, that Jesus Christ is his son, that he died for our sins. They cannot reason correctly concerning those facts of Christianity, and thus they cannot place their trust in God. They can't place their trust in Christ. They cannot place their trust in the gospel system. They cannot believe. They don't have that capability. Small babies can't talk. They might express some wishes by making some uh, noise at times, but they can't speak, they can't talk. Thus, they can't make that good confession and say the same thing as God said, this is my beloved son, and we saying the same thing as God, thou, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. There's repentance that is necessary, but yet babies are born innocent, free of sin. And because this is a major difference in religious world, very briefly let's mention the aspect that babies are born innocent. To enter into the kingdom of God, Jesus says, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 18 and verse 3. Now then, if you take the two positions, which one is the logical statement in relationship to what Jesus is saying? And what we're going to do is substitute those two positions for little children here. And the word little children can be translated babies. Except ye be converted and become as little demons, wicked, sinful be people, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, anyone in their right minds knows that's not what Jesus is saying. Yet, that's what the aspect of total depravity or inherited, inherited sin is saying. But if we substitute innocent, free of sin for that. Jesus says, except you be converted and become free of sin, become innocent, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. That makes perfect sense. 
That's what Jesus was saying. And thus we start learning or we learn that little children are not demons, not wicked sinners, not depraved. They are sinless. They are free of sin. And then Jesus also says, the next chapter in Matthew 19, verses 13 through 15, when little children were being brought to Jesus that he should put his hands on them and pray, the disciples rebuked them. And Jesus said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come to me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. Now then, in chapter 19, while chapter 18, he says to that's entering into the kingdom. Now then he's talking about those who are in the kingdom. The kingdom consists of little children. Again, little babies. Now then, are they, does the kingdom consist of wicked sinners, depraved people, or does it consist of those who are free of sin, who are innocent of sin? Well, obviously, it's one who is innocent of sin. In Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 29, Solomon would state, Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. Here's the way God made man. And he's talking about mankind in general, not just simply Adam. God made man upright, but they, that's how we know the plural there, they have sought out many inventions. What does man do? Man is born, he's made upright, but they go astray. They seek out those sinful actions. In Psalm 106, verse 37 and verse 38, the psalmist, in recounting the history of Israel, and as they are going astray and going after idolatry, it says, he says, Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils, and shed, and notice this, innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Those children, those babies, were innocent. They were not guilty of sin. He should have, if the idea of total depravity is true, said they shed guilty blood. They shed wicked blood. Depraved blood. Could have used any of those, but he didn't. He said it's innocent blood. And speaking of the king of Tyre in Ezekiel, the 28th chapter. In verse 15, he says, Concerning the king of Tyre, thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. In other words, God had created him perfect, that is sinless, but there came a time in his life when sin was found in him. There's a contrast between the iniquity being found in him and being perfect from the day that he was created. And so here's his being created. He is perfect. He is without sin or iniquity until a certain time comes within his life. And then he is found with sin or with iniquity. But there's the contrast, and that contrast does not hold up if he was created wicked or sinful. But that takes us to another idea. Where does man's spirit come from anyway? If man is, in his conception, born wicked and conceived in sin, the spirit of man thus is sinful. It's not his physical body, it's the spiritual aspect that is sinful. The only problem is, in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7, 
we're told that the Spirit shall return to God who gave it. God is the one who gave the Spirit. Thus, God is giving unto man something that is sinful and wicked and depraved. Now, who can believe such? Zechariah 12 and verse 1, he says that God formed the spirit of man within him. If total depravity is wrong, right and man is born a sinner, then God is forming within man something that is sinful. In Hebrews 12 and verse 9, God is described as the father of spirits as opposed to a physical father, the father of the flesh. The father of spirits. Thus is the father, God, the father of something that is depraved and sinful. No, because we know from James 1 and verse 17 that God gives that which is good. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God gives that which is good. He is the one who forms the spirit within man. He is the father of the spirit of man. The spirit is God given and he gives that which is good, not that which is depraved. And thus, when we come to that subject of baptism, baptism is not for an infant because they have no sin. And that's going to get us into the next point, but let me mention one last thing regarding that, and that there is no examples of babies being baptized in the New Testament. Just not there. Now, some want to read into it the passages that talk about the house of someone, but that's reading into some. That's coming to the Bible with a preconceived idea and reading it into the passage. The household does not necessarily include babies. It might simply refer to the servants that that person might have. It might refer to the family. It could refer to many things, but not necessarily infants. But then the purpose of baptism, and that is for the remission of sins. Mark 16 and verse 16 still states what it says. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. It takes belief and baptism to have salvation. Now we would notice that this salvation, as you look at that word within, as used in the New Testament, can have reference to two things. It can have reference to salvation from past sins, or it can have reference to salvation in heaven. In Mark 16, 16, we know that it is salvation from past sins because of parallel passages. Luke 24, verse 46 and 47, where it talks about the remission of sins. Well, thus, salvation from past sins is what he's dealing with. But we also see it in Acts 2 and verse 38, when it says, Peter said unto them, that's these individuals who had cried out based upon being convicted of their sin, the sin that they were convicted of specifically, is that you have crucified the Son of God. Now then, they recognizing their sin, wanting to be in a right relationship with God, thus a penitent person... People ask men and brethren, what shall we do? And the response is by Peter, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We look at that phrase, for the remission of sins. There's a problem that we face. A lot of people use Strong's Dictionary. And if you look at the book version, you're going to see a definition of it. But when it was brought over to an electronic version, and this is true in every electronic version that I've seen, they add something to what Strong's has 
has. Here is the exact quote from the electronic version of Strong's Concordance. For, as used in Acts 2.38, for the forgiveness, could have two meanings. If you saw a poster saying, Jesse James wanted for robbery, for could mean Jesse is wanted so he can commit a robbery. Or is wanted because he has committed a robbery. The latter sense is the correct one. So too in this passage. The word for signifies an action in the past. Otherwise it would violate the entire tenor of the New Testament teaching on salvation by grace and not by works. End quote. When we're dealing with the English word for, it could mean either because of, as he uses that illustration, Jesse James wanted for robbery because he has committed robberies. Action in the past. It could mean, though, the word English word for, you want him for robbery in order to commit a robbery in the future. Now, he says, uh, they have added, uh, the la- in the way that I worded it there, the first sense, sense, that he is wanted because he has committed robberies. In other words, actions that Jesse James has taken in the past, and now then he is wanted. He see a wanted poster on him because of actions that have already taken place. And so they come to this Acts 2 and verse 38 mentioned specifically for the remission of sins. And he's saying that is action that has taken place in the past. You already have the remission of sins. And so you repent and be baptized because you already have, have in the past forgiveness of sins or remission of sins. Now then, that's what they added to the book version of Strong's. I was trying to think of a way in which I could put the book version up along with this, but uh, trying to get the book version, the lettering is very small, and it would never be able to be seen. (laughs) But there's a couple copies in the library. We have an excellent library. I hope you'll take advantage of it. Get it and look at it. What he says about the English word for, or what they added, not Strong's, but what they added to Strong's about the English word for is true. That can be. However, even as we saw with baptism, the English word does not necessarily always convey the proper meaning of the the original language. The Greek word is the word ace, or ice as some pronounce it. And it never refers to action in the past. This Greek word always is looking forward to something. To use the illustration of Jesse James wanted for robbery, it would be, if you're using that Greek word ace, in order for him to commit a robbery in the future. You're wanting, you're searching him out in order to help him or get him to commit a robbery in the future. Our English word for can be used that way and is used that way, but that's the only way that the Greek word ace is used. It's it's found over 1,700 times in the New Testament. Not one time. Does it ever refer to action that is in the past? It always is looking forward to something. Unless, of course, Acts 2.38 is the one exception out of those 1,700. Over 1,700. Well, it's not. Very seldom will you find individuals who will admit that repentance does not precede forgiveness of sins or salvation 
And yet, whatever the for in Acts 2.38 means in relationship or in relative to baptism, it also means the same thing for repentance. Repent and be baptized. You have to take both of them. Whatever for the remission of sins means in relationship to baptism, it has to mean in relationship to repentance. Whatever it means in relationship to repentance, it has to mean in relationship to baptism. You cannot separate them and say, well, it means one thing for baptism and something else for repentance. Some, in order to try to escape the problem that they face of salva teaching salvation by faith only and yet the need for repentance, they then have changed the order to repent first comes prior to faith. So you first have to repent before you even have faith. Now, a question, how can you turn to God in God's appointed way if you don't even believe in God? Now, the idea of that is really rather foolish. Repentance has to follow faith by the very nature of the case. And yet, in order to continue to teach this salvation by faith only, and yet realizing that without faith or without repentance you shall all likewise perish, that Jesus said in Luke 13, 3 and verse 5 also, they then transpose repentance and faith. So repentance comes before faith. But as so often is the case, the Bible becomes its best own in interpreter. When we turn over to Matthew, the 26th chapter and verse 28, this word for the remission of sins, that phrase is found both in the English, but it's the exact same phrase in the Greek as we find in Acts 2.38. Same phrase, Matthew 26.28, when Jesus says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Same phrase, English and Greek. Now then, did Jesus shed his blood because sins were already forgiven? Well, no one would hold such. What a waste of Christ's death that would be if our sins were already forgiven. He wouldn't need to die. But he shed his blood so we could have the forgiveness of sins. It's looking forward to something in the future. Not something that's already taken place in the past. As we see other passages that deal with this subject. Acts 22 and verse 16. Ananias comes to Saul and he sees an, an individual who is penitent, who believes because of what had taken place on the road to Damascus. And thus many in, individuals hold he was saved on the road to Damascus when he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? But he wasn't saved then because he still had his sins upon him. How do we know that? Because Ananias comes to him and says, Why tearest thou, rise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. He still had his sins. So he wasn't saved, he wasn't regenerated prior to this time. Regeneration took place at the point of baptism. That's when he was saved. Not prior to that time. In 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, it says that the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism doth also now save us. Yet the denominational world in general teaches that baptism doth not save us. And they changed the wording of what Peter said 
The baptism doth also now save us. The baptism doth not save us. They do exactly what Satan did in the garden when he told Eve, Thou shalt not surely die. But also in understanding the purpose of baptism, we must understand why we're being baptized to be baptized scripturally. An individual cannot obey God accidentally, not in true, the true idea of obedience. It takes the right act based upon the right belief to constitute, constitute biblical baptism or true obedience. You might take, for example, the emblems of the Lord's Supper, but if you're not doing it for the purpose that God set forth, then it's not partaking of the Lord's Supper. It's eating some unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. You've done the right act, but you haven't been obedient unto God. To be baptized because sin, you believe your sins have already been forgiven is not Bible baptism. It's not Bible baptism just to obey God, being baptized to obey God in some vague idea of obedience. You have to understand what you're doing. That's what faith is all about, an understanding of what is right. And so baptism must be based upon a proper understanding of what you're doing, which means a proper understanding of the purpose of that baptism. Then one other thing that we will mention in this plan that God has set forth, while that act of baptism is that act that takes away our past sins, God then demands that we remain faithful to the end. We must develop within ourselves the proper attitudes. As Peter puts it in 2 Peter 1, verse 3 and verse 4, we need to be partakers of the divine nature. When he says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge... Go back and study that word knowledge in relationship to faith. According to the knowledge of our Lord or of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. We become a partaker of God's nature. That's having the proper attitude. Paul would write to the Philippians in chapter 4 and verse 8, say, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. There's the attitudes that we as Christians must have. But then we must, and that's certainly not all of them, but that gives us a good start. We must have and develop within ourselves the attitudes that God has, those attributes of God. But then we must properly apply those attitudes, that, those characteristics to our life. And that's what Romans 12 Verse 1 and verse 2 is all about. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. And if we had time, we could go into that idea of presenting your body. It is an action that takes place in the past. That past is at that act of baptism. We are at baptism presenting our bodies to Christ as a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, here at that act of baptism, in which we have our sins taken away, the forgiveness of sins, 
we are at that time presenting our bodies to God to live a holy life now, a life that will be acceptable unto God. And we change our mind, not to be conformed to the world any longer, but now then transformed by the changing of that mind to prove what's good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're going to change our life now to conform to what God sets forth. We allow those attitudes that God has, those characteristics of God, His divine nature, to make a change within our life. Applying those things to our life. And then we must continue that way to the end. In Matthew, the 10th chapter, why he's t- speaking specifically of the apostles here, he tells them, You shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. You apostles, you disciples need to endure to the end. There's a principle that is set forth in relationship and Jesus was sending out his apostles in Matthew the 10th chapter on what we refer to as the limited commission. But there's the principle that's behind it. You continue on to the end. In Revelation 2 and verse 10, They're told, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. And while I recognize that that phrase, be faithful unto death, is dealing with even if it causes you to be put to death, you remain faithful. Yet the very principle, if you're going to remain faithful, even if it causes you to be put to death, means that we have to continue until we are put to death. Until death comes, we must remain faithful. No wonder Paul would write at the end of that great chapter on the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You continue on. You be steadfast. Don't allow anyone to move you away from God's work. You continue in the work of the Lord. And abound in that work, because then your labor will not be in vain. Then you'll be receiving that eternal home with God. And so God has set forth a plan for man to be saved. But it takes man's part as well. In being saved, and then in remaining saved. And if we're we have not obeyed God's will in being saved, we would encourage you this morning to obey those things that we've discussed in these past weeks. Do those things so that you can be saved from your past sins. Then live that type of life that God wants you to live. Apply those principles that God of His nature to your life so that you will live faithful to Him and thus be saved eternally in heaven. If you have fallen away, though, and no longer live that type of life, we would encourage you to repent this morning. Let us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins so that you can once again be saved. If you need to come, we would encourage you to do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.